out here. Wood. Yeah, I have Jeff problem. I'd like to uh, start by welcoming Graham Velcott from Australia to the Maritimes. Nice to be here. It's good to have you with us. Uh, Graham is a, uh, an expert on uh, public transportation uh, and specializes in uh, uh, passenger rail and uh, partnerships and alliances between operators and various uh, means of support for passenger rail services. So he brings to us uh, expertise from uh, a country which has a number of good comparison points with Canada in terms of a low population density, a large amount of uh, wilderness area, uh, and a difficult climate, so perhaps the opposite extreme from, from ours. And I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, Tim Heyman, who is a uh, graduate student here in Halifax, studying here uh, in Halifax and living, uh, or his home I guess, is in uh, uh, at the Brockville area, Ontario, and he uses the uh, train service uh, on a fairly regular basis uh, between home and studies. And uh, Tim, I understand your uh, background is in biology. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, that you uh, enjoy riding the train. And Certainly. Uh, you share some of your observations uh, with the, uh, I think it's a magazine or a blog. Uh, it's an online right? publication, uh, an online newsletter of Canadian Railway Observations. Yeah, we publish it every month uh, to a number of, we had about 7,500 subscribers in camp at the moment. Excellent. So I thought we'd just chat for a few minutes about your, uh, both of your insights. I suppose I should say who I am. I'm uh, a, an urban planner by trade, uh, but I'm the uh, Vice President East of Transport Action Canada and also on the board for Transport Action Atlantic. I use the uh, trains a great deal along with my wife uh, to get to Montreal. So I think we all have a uh, you know, an interest in this form of travel in this future. So Graham, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask you how your trip was and uh, what, what your impressions were of uh, the VRL service. Well, uh, I, as I was saying to you earlier the, uh, this afternoon, uh, my trip uh, today, or the past two days from Montreal to Halifax, as an actual fact, has been part of what is almost a two-month rail travel holiday across Canada starting off in Vancouver and it'll finish in Vancouver. Um, but in particular, I've been very impressed with the Via Rail service uh, on all of the services we've been on, but in particular with the Ocean, which is a very topical train at the present moment in regard to the accommodation, the service, the arrangements in Montreal, uh, the quality of the food service, and the facilities that are on board the train. It's a, it is an excellent service in my 30 years experience. Uh, in uh, travelling on that train, uh, did it seem to be all tourists or did you have a sense that uh, other, uh, there were other kinds of markets being served? There were, there were a number of markets. From an international tourism perspective, which is only one component of, of, a, of a passenger service like this, there were people from Australia, three lots of people from Australia, uh, United Kingdom and also a number of uh, United States uh, visitors. But interesting were the number of students who were travelling through to Halifax and other places for education and experienced that on the Canadian as well. And then also meeting people who got on at smaller places who were coming to larger centres such as Halifax for special visits. So you see uh, rural residents use it yes. as well. Yes. What sort of impression have you had, Tim, on your travels in terms well, of like, the ridership? Yes. Well, I can certainly uh, very much back up what Graham has said so far, that 
uh, we do see very much a diversity of people on there. The students are a major component, I know, as being one of them over the last five years traveling there. And the ocean actually has an interesting uh, kind of ridership pattern that we don't necessarily see everywhere else through the system, but you have in addition to kind of peak times around Christmas and certain times during the summer when the tourism picks up, you also do have these peaks around spring break kind of time and at the end of the summer, like right now, where the students are coming back. It certainly is well used in that regard, but as well, you have people coming for tourism, but a lot of people, and I think it's very often overlooked, is the number of people who are coming between the small communities, uh, especially through parts of New Brunswick and parts of Quebec as well. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, do either of you think about the, the recent decision to reduce the frequency of this train service from six days a week to, to three? Well, I suppose if I take a, a sort of a truly independent perspective, uh, there is a dilemma. And the dilemma, I suppose, on one aspect is that putting aside the actual construction or capital cost of providing a train service, the, the issue is the ongoing operating expenditure. And, uh, and from that particular point of view, these services can be very expensive to maintain. If we go from a purely transport perspective, we absolutely know that frequency is a big driver of patronage. And having had identical experiences in Australia where we have reduced frequency or withdrawn service, we've then seen patronage on what is remaining plummet dramatically. Conversely, where we have reinstated services in a number of areas of Victoria as an example, Western Australia and other locations, we have seen a patronage boom. So frequency is important. And how do you feel uh, Tim, from your experience as a rider? I, I can certainly, again, very much go along those same lines that I think the frequency is something that's really important and I've heard from plenty of people, I know from the student perspective and a lot of the young people talking about it, that even six times a week, and just one train a day, six times a week, a lot of people already saw as reduce or a low frequency, especially when you have the option to fly you know, several flights a day, going from the airport seven days a week. If you're driving, you can go any day. If you have the bus, you can go any day. So the idea of actually of actually dropping things down again to only three times out of the week, cutting that service, and also moving the days that you're going to have one of those departure days be on the Tuesday, which had been the day where previously there was no service for quite a number of years, I, I would certainly expect to see, uh, to see a certain drop in ridership in the future. As we uh, bring our discussion to a conclusion, I, I wonder if uh, perhaps uh, both of you would have some suggestions or advice as we think about the future of passenger rail in Canada. Yeah, well, look, my, my advice is very simple. I think all people in the community, including those who don't have a direct interest in the rail service, would appreciate that it is an issue for government about the cost of delivering the service. So the reality really is to go back to the fundamentals, understand the four or five market segments that we touched on briefly, briefly find out which ones are fundamental in terms of service needs and which ones, such as international tourism or regional tourism, add value. And that may mean that the future of the ocean is not the same train or service that it is today, but in actual fact is one that is built around its core requirements of the role that it needs to perform, and then have partnerships even with other providers. Now, I, I understand the delivery model, but it may be a different delivery model. It may be a different style of train using the existing equipment. But one of the things that I think is important for us to understand is that government does have to weigh this up each and every day. So if there's value in leveraging all the transport collateral that's there and using it to an advantage such as regional feeder buses to the large centres along the corridor, and doing what bus does very well in bringing those people to a spine. And that the service may be a tiered service, it may be that at the peaks it is like the Ocean is today, and other times it may be a much smaller train 
running on a sort of an extended daylight schedule, only calling at these major nodes along the corridor. I don't think we should be getting ourselves entrenched that it's the ocean or nothing. And I think just to add one more point to that, I think those are all certainly important ideas for how things could be improved. One of the things that it certainly has been lacking in the past years, I think, in VIA's approach to things. It's also on the marketing side of it, is that you have a train that a lot of people, even in the service as it exists now, a lot of people either don't know that it's even there or don't know benefits. There are a lot of things that, especially when you're dealing with I, well, any sector of the market, really, I certainly see from, a, from the perspective of a young person looking to travel frequently, there are a lot of benefits in terms of the uh, kind of the, the comfort and the, the overall experience that you have there, as well as it being a, especially with the student discounts and rewards programs, it can be a very cost-effective way to go as well. But that's something that certainly VIA has not been doing in terms of the marketing of those aspects and making people aware of that. And no matter what we do in terms of changing the service to make it better, if people don't know that it's there and don't know the benefits about it, then it's certainly going to, we're going to have to continue to have some problems. Look, I do know that we're over time, but there is one international experience that I would relate very quickly, and that is what happens in terms of the role of the social uh, viability and health of communities where rail services are withdrawn or reduced versus those where we've had the experience in Australia where passenger rail services have been put back. And there is evidence that does demonstrate that a transport service either the of like the OCN or something like it, as I mentioned earlier, does actually add to social inclusion and the general viability of the region, and that's an important consideration. Yes, I would agree. And maybe just as a planner, I'll just conclude with one final thought, and that's that uh, rail it does have the advantage of being able to serve intermediate points without deviating from its route, which is something that's very difficult to do if you're relying solely on buses using freeways, where you have to get off the freeway get back, back on it again or else you have to dump people off at the interchange. So thank you both of you for your thoughts and insights and uh, it's been a very interesting uh, if uh, somewhat short chat. Thank you again for, thank for you your time. Thank you.